All right, let's talk angular momentum. That is given the variable of L. And to figure out what it is equal to, we will think about the equation for linear momentum, which is P. This is equal to mass times velocity. The angular equivalent of mass is moment of inertia, and the angular equivalent of velocity is angular velocity. Therefore, angular momentum equals moment of inertia times angular velocity. The same is true for impulse, which doesn't have a variable when it is angular. It's just going to be delta L. And linear impulse is equal to force times time, force over time. So, or force exerted over time. So, the angular equivalent of force is going to be torque. So it is torque exerted over time. Now, let's think about angular momentum in a little bit of a different way. I is always going to be equal to some fraction times mass times radius squared. Angular, angular velocity is going to be equal to regular velocity times sine of theta. We don't normally put the sine of theta because it's normally just perpendicular divided by a radius. Here we are compensating for the fact in case there is a velocity vector that is not perpendicular to the radius. So now we can put these into our original equation. L equals A over B times mass times radius squared. All of that is going to be times, although it doesn't really matter because it's almost location. <laughs> Sorry for the dog barking. It's going to be equal to velocity times sine of theta divided by radius. And so now we can simplify this. You may have noticed that it is there is an r squared and there is an r in a denominator of a fraction. This is going to simplify to be one radius. So it becomes a over b times m times r times v times sine of theta. So that's pretty cool. And now we're going to use this to figure out what the angular momentum of an object that is neither rotating nor revolving but is moving in a straight line is. Here's the velocity vector. Here's the cube that is just sliding across the floor. So to find angular momentum, we need to have a radius. And for a radius, we have to have a pivot point. So we're just going to pick the easiest one, and that is one that is directly below the velocity vector. And thus, the radius and the velocity vector form a right angle. They're perpendicular. And so there is basically no sine theta. Sine of theta is equal to 1. And since it is a point mass, because it's basically just like a block rotating, uh, rotating around a point, it is just going to be 1. So the, the angular momentum is going to be mass times radius times velocity. But what if this block moves? It used to be here. Now is over here. Here's the velocity vector. We cannot move the pivot point. So now we have a new radius. I call it R2. How do we figure out what R2 is? Well, we can simply make a triangle. It's going to be a right triangle, and therefore we can use traditional trigonometry. We'll just call this a theta. That works. And basically, sine of theta is going to be equal to opposite over hypotenuse, Sakatoa, r over r2. We multiply both sides by r2, and then divide both sides by sine theta. <laughs> Those are the dogs. So now we have r2 is equal to r divided by sine of theta. Let's write our angular momentum equation. A over B, oh, that's actually just going to be 1 because it's a point mass, times mass, times, well, it's going to be R, but this time it's R2. And then it is going to be times sine of whatever angle is in between the velocity vector and the radius. And that is going to be this angle. And this angle right here is 180 minus theta. I'm running out of room here, sine of 180 minus theta, 
or pi minus theta if you're working in radians. I don't know, I find degrees is kind of easier sometimes. Although radians certainly come in handy when dealing with more math. And so now we can substitute in the r2 m times r over sine of theta times sine of 180 degrees minus theta. Now, can we simplify this any further? This seems like a lot of math. Well, we can. When studying sine, and especially during the, during the unit circle, we know that sine of theta is equal to sine of 180 degrees minus theta. Due to the whole nature of the unit circle is that when you reflect a point over here, it's like the same sign. It's pretty cool. <laughs> That's not a perfect explanation, but it's okay for now. These cancel out because they are equal. And so now, oh, I forgot the V. That's totally my bad. It is MRV. It's the same thing. It's literally the same thing. So no matter how far it moves, it's just going to be the same. Um, one is a point mass. And I think it's always going to be a point mass if it's going to be an object moving linearly in a straight line. So now let's talk about what happens when there is no net torque on an object on a system. Well, we know that when there is no net force, momentum is conserved. All of the momentum, linear momentum, of moment one is going to be equal to all of the linear momentum of a moment later, after a certain event. And so now we can apply the same rule to our angular uh, version of this. All of the angular momentum on one side, or one moment before a certain event, is going to be equal to all of the angular momentum after another, or in the moment after. So that's pretty interesting, and you can use that to solve. Um, the key things that you can use to solve are basically like just the definition of uh, angular momentum, um, angular impulse, and then this whole um, conservation of angular momentum. Now, we remember that with linear momentum, we had some different collisions. We had sticky, we had bouncy, and we have explosion. <laughs> Basically, two objects become one, two objects stay two objects after colliding, and then one object becomes two objects. But what about when it is angular? Well, we basically have also three. I'll put a little S, B, E. Pretty cool. Now, we kind of have these. They're a little bit different. Let's talk about sticky first. This is probably the easiest. This is basically when two objects combine, one or more are rotating. You can see here a disc falls on another disc, and then they basically become joined and they both are rotating. So that's one type of collision. Now for bouncy, bouncy is basically when they stay two separate objects, but one starts stationary, one is starts spinning, and then at the end they're both spinning. So let's think about this weird device. Here are some pipes, and these are some hinges, and there's a disc, and this disc is stationary. It is not rotating around this, but this one is. It is going counterclockwise, but then all of a sudden, we decide to flip this side down. And so now this disc is actually going to be spinning clockwise. And so um, for the angular momentum to be conserved, we need to have basically the same direction with the same magnitude. So this disc has to start spinning pretty heavily in counterclockwise to maintain the linear or the angular momentum. Now the last one, which is not really explosion, it's more like sticky, but it is when you have an object that is spinning and an object that is not collide. So I'll call it spin x naught. 
And for an example, here's a disc that is rotating at a speed of V, has a radius of R, a mass of M, and then there's this ball that's like sticky. And oh man, it's, it's heading towards it, it's gonna hit it. And it's going at a speed of V over two, and it has a mass of M over four. And so what you need to know when you have cases of linear and spinning or angular is that you have to maintain both the angular momentum and the linear momentum. And so you would use these two equations and the equations up here to figure out what would happen, but in the moment before they collide and in the moment after. And that's pretty much all you need to know. Good luck on the test.